The New Orleans streetcar is an iconic symbol of the Big Easy, and it's one that's been around for more than 150 years. In fact, the St. Charles Avenue streetcar was one of the first passenger railroads in the United States. And by the way, it's still the oldest running street railway in the entire world. Each year, millions of people take that streetcar around town to see the sights or just to get to work or maybe just to enjoy a leisurely ride. It is truly one of the best ways to experience the magic of New Orleans while taking in those live oaks and storied neighborhoods throughout the city. But most importantly, on one night in January, the streetcar plays an essential role in ringing in a very special time of year. Twelfth Night. Here we go. It marks the first day of carnival season, also known as Mardi Gras. And in New Orleans, it begins with the funny 40 fellows hopping on that famous green street car, rumbling down St. Charles Avenue, sipping champagne, and tossing the first beads of Mardi Gras to cheering crowds. All the while, masked members wave from windows above a big sign that reads, it's carnival time, and to New Orleanians, that means it's time to eat king cake and get ready for the festivities ahead. The Fellows are an historic Mardi Gras organization that was founded back in 1878 before taking a very long hiatus and beginning its carnival countdown with the annual ride in 1982, almost 100 years later. Its members are known for their whimsical costumes reflecting topical themes. And of course, the ceremonial toast that kicks off the season with a bang, or more specifically, a live brass band performance right there on the streetcar. Although the Funny 40 Fellows usually have about 70 members in one car, this year they'll have to scale back to just 25 fellows in order to socially distance and make that event safe for everybody involved. And while it might not have quite the same ring to it, we can rest assured that champagne will be flowing and the streetcar will be rolling toward yet another glorious carnival season. Because as we've seen with so many holidays this year, traditions may change, but the spirit, the spirit always remains strong. Happy carnival, y'all. We have a very special guest hosting for us tonight. He's a New Orleans native, best known for his role as Salvatore Romano on the award-winning series Mad Men. As an actor, his talents has taken him from TV screens to Broadway stages and local theaters. But he's also an author, interior design expert, and the co-owner of Hazelnut, a popular home goods and fine gift shop located right here in New Orleans. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming the wonderful Brian Batt. Hello, and welcome to our first ever virtual Mardi Gras, live from the one and only Mardi Gras world right here in New Orleans. We're missing our regular carnival festivities just as much as y'all are. So we thought we'd do something a little different and bring the best party of the year straight to you and yours. Tonight, we'll be joined by some very special guests to talk about the history of Mardi Gras and the people that make it so spectacular. Plus, We've got live musical performances, exclusive interviews, and more, all lined up for a most unforgettable night of carnival magic. So sit back, relax, and les bon temps rouler. That means that the good times roll. Tonight's show is made possible through the generous support of our sponsors.
For those of you experiencing the magic of Mardi Gras with us for the very first time, we'd like to give you a little history lesson on how it all began. Now, way before there were parades and beads and costume balls here in the South, Mardi Gras was a celebration that had been traced all the way back to medieval Europe, eventually making its way to 18th century France, where it became known as Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras. It wasn't until 1699 when a French explorer by the name of Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne de Bienville landed near present-day New Orleans on Mardi Gras Eve, otherwise known as Lundi Gras. Then the holiday became a cherished tradition here in America. Bienville went on to establish the city of New Orleans in 1718, and in the years since, Mardi Gras became the annual celebration we all know and love today. So here's Henri Schindler, Arthur Hardy, and Clarence Becknell with more on the history of Mardi Gras. It's always hard to pinpoint a date when the custom started. French explorer, Canadian French explorer Iberville and his men were sailing up the Mississippi River. This is 19 years before New Orleans was founded. And they stopped at a point and knew the date was March 3rd, which was Mardi Gras back in France. So they named that spot Point du Mardi Gras and the Bayou, Bayou Mardi Gras. That spot is still there. That's how Mardi Gras came to North America, March 3rd, 1699. The meaning of the two words Mardi Gras is Fat Tuesday, the last day to get fat to enjoy the pleasures of the flesh before the next day, which is Ash Wednesday, the 40 days of Lent. So it's a celebration before a period of penance. Carnival and Mardi Gras have always been a reflection of their time. Um, there was carnival, you know, during French and Spanish colonial period, and then the Americans arrived en masse after the Louisiana Purchase, and it was right before the Civil War that the first of the um, social groups called a crew, that took the name crew, uh, got going. There were several early, what is now called old line crews that were mostly white, wealthy men, and they began rituals of having float parades and also private balls that followed those float parades. So the first Mardi Gras in New Orleans would have been a ball, a carnival ball, which were when people came together and had these, uh, these, these parties and they would mask. You would have revelers that would go through and they would hand out candies and little gifts to people. In the 1850s, Mardi Gras had become kind of um, raucous and body and the press actually called for an end to Mardi Gras. They said, people are getting out of control, using the mask to do harm to other people. Fortunately, six men who had belonged to a Mobile Mardi Gras organization, which paraded on New Year's Eve, decided to start a Mardi Gras parade on Mardi Gras night in New Orleans. They were called the Mystic Crew of Columbus. They started it all. And the early groups all used mythological namesakes. Today, organizations can be named after anything they want, but we still follow that general model of a group of people getting together, getting on floats, and having a party. Everything that we know of today with parades and theme floats, all of that came from Comus. The word crew, the nature of the parades. Many people of African descent who were not um, participating in those events uh, of course, forged their own carnival traditions, including the, um, the Zulu group got going, Mardi Gras Indians, baby dolls and skull and bones. And they took elements of white supremacy and uh, aesthetics from African culture and Native American culture and forged ingenious, brilliant, and beautiful traditions themselves, many of which still exist today. Well, every parade follows a format, basically uh, floats marching bands, you have royalty in parades, kings, queens, uh, there'll be marching units, there'll be uh, equestrian units, uh, and of course the thing that separates our parades from those elsewhere like Macy's or Rose Parade, our parades are crowd participation events, you don't watch a parade, you're part of it, because we throw items of, of value or just fun to the crowds. So our, our events are not spectator events, they're crowd participation events. So the first throws in Carnival um, go back to those very beginning days when they would actually hand out favors or little sweets to different people. And that was the very beginning. And then, of course, in 1960, the first Rex de Balloon um, was thrown. Uh, and then the beads and this, that business has gotten to be just, it's crazy. Um, Mardi Gras celebrations in terms of parades started out as a single day event in 1857. One parade, two floats. Fast forward to 2020, we had more than 50 parades over a 12-day period. 
So it's grown into a, a extremely large and diverse event thread, spread throughout the city. One of the things that surprises people is that it's not corporately sponsored. Name another entertainment event that's not brought to you by someone, from a golf tournament to a bowl game, they're all sponsored. The citizens of New Orleans are the sponsors of Mardi Gras. The makeup of each crew and composition of different crews are a reflection of different groups of people coming together who want to enjoy life together. They have a common sense of humor, a common aesthetics and values. And uh, the more crews are integrated, the more that, that demonstrates that people are forging relationships and alliances that are, that are deep and playful. This is really beautiful to behold in our city today. Here at the New Orleans Airport, we're working to keep our guests, crews, and employees healthy and safe by implementing physical distancing measures. Big Sam even showed up to help by ensuring that people in line are standing far enough apart from each other. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry about that. Keep up the good work. This is just one way MSY is travel ready, and we're looking forward to seeing you whenever you are. One of my personal highlights was singing the national anthem at the Saints game. And if you've ever been to a Saints game at the Superdome, you'll recognize these next performers. They dance, they cheer, they wear black and gold gear. But most importantly, these talented dancers are essential when it comes to getting fans all hyped up and yelling, Who dat? on game day. So, without further ado, please welcome the sensational Saints Sations. Everybody clap your hands. Billy Nungesser is a New Orleans native who has dedicated most of his life to serving our great state. Once dubbed the hardest working man in Louisiana, he has continually stood by his community during the toughest of times. The man handled everything from natural disasters and oil spills to Louisiana's Department of Culture, Recreation and Tourism and, well, all of 2020. Please join us in welcoming our very own Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. Hello, I'm Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. I'd like to welcome everyone to Mardi Gras for all y'all. On behalf of the Office of Tourism, I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Mardi Gras celebration. While 2021 Mardi Gras isn't like other years, the Mardi Gras celebration is alive and well across Louisiana. I can't wait for you to experience the show we have for you from scenes from around the great state. Music, food, dancing, art, culture, you're going to see so much more. And I know after watching this, you're going to want to come down and see Louisiana for yourself. But until then, sit back and relax and feed your soul with all that is wonderful in my home state, Louisiana. So let's kick off the show with New Orleans original tuxedo jazz band playing Why Don't You Go Down to New Orleans.
You can ride no street car, celebrate mighty ground by no means. Go down to New Orleans. Red beans and rice, boy, they're nice. Do the big crowd thing. Go to food, cafe, every day. You might see a kind of a queen. This is Dixon night. Played by great jazz fans, by no means. Go down to New Orleans. Never have ice or snow. Why don't we go down to New Orleans? You can ride an old streetcar, celebrate Mardi Gras. Why don't we go down to New Orleans? Red beans and rice, boy, they nice. With a big problem, go to food, cafe every day. Might see it kind of a queen. Listen to Dixon Land, played by a great jazz band. Why don't we go down to New Orleans? Come on, James. See, I know place to go, but they never have ice and snow. Why don't we go down to New Orleans? You can ride an old streetcar, celebrate modern ground. Why don't we go down to New Orleans? Red beans and rice, boy, and they nice with a big problem. Go to food, cafe every day. Might seem kind of a queen. This is the Dixon Land, played by great jazz band. Why don't you go down the new world? Preservation Hall has been the home of traditional jazz in New Orleans since 1961, when it became a place for musicians to freely explore the unique culture of a genre largely influenced by Caribbean, African, and European traditions. Up until last year, the intimate venue would host daily concerts featuring their house band, the renowned Preservation Hall Jazz Band, as well as bands made up of musicians who all learned traditional jazz techniques from those who played there before them. Sometimes you never know what Grammy-winning artist will show up and sit in. Watching these talented performers is a real treat, and we can't wait to see them live and in person once again. But for now, please join us in welcoming the one and only Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Preservation Hall opened its doors in 1961 as a space that celebrated the African-American jazz pioneers and traditional New Orleans sound that our city is known for. Now we're going into our 60th year and we've remained pretty close to achieving what my parents set out to do and that was create a stage where New Orleans musicians could play the music that's been a part of their families for generations and generations. In New Orleans music particularly New Orleans jazz, is, is a reflection of uh, an incredible, incredible community that's uh, really the, the, the heart and soul of New Orleans, and that, that's the African-American community of the city. And the traditions that passed from generation to generation and really is an ancestral connection really back to, to Africa. We're open and, and there's lines of people coming in and there's music happening and there's people crowded into this little room from all over the globe. It's uh, really one of the most amazing experiences to watching that transformation, you know, the discovery of this space and then the connection that takes place between the musicians and yourself and, and the audience 
and to see people's uh, bodies change and their facial 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 expressions change, you 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 actually see people leave differently. They leave having had a, a life changing experience. The future here at Preservation Hall really is uh, a reflection of the past. It's understanding the past and understanding all of the things that brought us to this point here today. Mardi Gras to the world, y'all. After Katrina, there were three things that helped sew New Orleans back together. Mardi Gras, Jazz Fest, and the Saints. And those are three cultural forces that are a part of all New Orleanians. There's no place in the world like New Orleans, and Jazz Fest is New Orleans. It's food, 
its art, at its soul, the music, and in its heart, the people. That's what makes Jazz Fest, and that's what makes Mardi Gras, the people of New Orleans. In 2019, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival celebrated its 50th anniversary right here at the fairgrounds. And on October the 8th, we are ready to get back out here again and make the magic. The first artist to confirm for Jazz Fest after Katrina was Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy's always been a centerpiece of Jazz Fest. He played here early on. He was bigger than we were. He helped grow the festival to what it is today. He is the great American troubadour. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Buffett. I am a child of the Mardi Gras. I will wear a costume anywhere, any place, any time. Mardi Gras has always been a part of my life. And uh, growing up as a child in the parades, I started out as a child of the Mardi Gras in Mobile and I made it all the way to being the king of Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Many, many good things that happened to me in this crazy job, but one of them is to be able to sit on this stage in New Orleans with my dear friend, Mr. Alan Toussaint. Maestro. What does New Orleans mean to me? Where do I start? It means a whole hell of a lot. So let's start where it all started. When I was a kid going over there to meet my grandfather's ship, when he would come in at the Governor Nickel Street Wharf, and take us all as a family over to Two Jacks, his favorite restaurant, for dinner. And it was Buffett family reunions when Captain Buffett came back to New Orleans. My musical background, it went from playing bars around Mobile to Biloxi, but always hearing about how great the music was and if you really made it, you were playing on Bourbon Street. All the great groups of the time we're on Burger Street. I met the Neville brothers the first time when they played at the Ivanhoe. And that's where music was happening. Hell, Frogman Henry was hanging with the Beatles. And even my band, the Upstairs Alliance, was headlining to buy a room on Bourbon Street. One of the first jazz fests I ever went to was in Louis Armstrong Park. Being in New Orleans the first year that the Saints actually played, being at the first game when John Gilliam ran the opening kickoff back for a touchdown. So that whole thing of the Saints coming to town and Jimmy came to town actually happened about the same time. The beginnings were incredible. The continuation of my love of the food, the music, the mud and the blood, as they say. And I wrote a little song called Creole, and that's what it is. It's in the food, it's in the blood, it's in the mood, it's in the mud. It's a spicy kind of life, Creole. If I could put what New Orleans means to me in a song, I think I just did. <laughs> and it still does. I think Mardi Gras should be a national holiday in America. And everybody should spend two days off getting to know each other in the streets better. Moderation is the key to just about everything. <laughs> Even on Mardi Gras Day. <laughs> you can hold back the moon, can't stop the ebb and There's a joy of life you'll find only in Louisiana. A spirit of celebration that takes your senses places they've never been before. Where expressions of joy are an art form and our way of life. Where an abundance of good food, good times, and great music means there's more than enough to go around. Come one, come y'all. Come feed your soul in Louisiana. I'm John Goodman inviting you to visit louisianatravel.com and plan your getaway today.
spirit hit us today. Basically, the spirit. It wasn't just us singing. Those drums, when we beat those drums and beat those tambourines, something comes inside of our bodies. Believe it or not, it is a spirit that hits our bodies and it controls us. They say Jackie Mo. And this culture has been around a long time. This culture has been around just as long as Comus, Rex, Endymion, everything. Oh, you get worried, don't you get scared. Got a pretty queen coming back and healing free. When it first came into order, it was like very secretive. The Mardi Gras black Indian culture came from the native Indians. We were enslaved, and also the Indians were enslaved. So being on the reservation, being a part of slavery too, we, we adapted to their culture. They gave us the culture. So, I mean, now Mardi Gras, we portray Native Indians on Mardi Gras. Washington Nation, yeah, Pocahontas, met Wild Apache, and I went where your time, I met the Creole Wild West. Why make no y'all? Tulane and Padita. I met a golden eagle, girl pop a needle. Met a gang I love it. When you put, oh God, the first time I put on the crown, I'm, it, it's, I can't describe the feeling, but you become someone else. It's, it's something in me that transforms me. And you may see me, ah, or you might see me, ah. It's just not my normal self. I, I'm not like that every day. But when you hear these drums, I hear these drums and we beat and sing these songs, it comes out of me. Just can't, I can't say nothing else about that. It's just, it's, it's weird, man. Queen said before, when you put that crown on, something comes over you. That's true. Every Indian knows this. When they put that on, they sing them songs, they feel it. If you don't feel it, you ain't no Indian. It's very sacred. I mean, it's, it's, it's our way of releasing the spirits of, of the Indian nation, all the people that came before us and gone now. And I will mass until I die. I'm 63. If they have to, and I always told them, if you push me in a wheelchair, just put my crown on my head, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. India! India from where downtown? That's a song. A, a cock eye chief and a bull leg queen. I'm singing, man. I'm, I'm, I'm in my spirit, man. I'm in my spirit. We got to roll on. One more, one more good number. Spirit, huh? Yeah, one more, one more. One more good number. Galatoire's was founded by Jean Galatoire in 1905. It's been in the family since then. It's all the way into the fifth generation today. It's a special spot for people because typically they, their first visit uh, was with their grandmother or their, you know, their great aunt or someone that was trying to introduce them to the history and traditions of Galatoire's, to the history and traditions of New Orleans and, and being a part of, you know, that, that enjoyment of life, that celebration. Friday lunch at Galatoire's is a special occasion because to many, it's the start of the weekend. So when they come, they don't typically have any intention of going back to work. And so there's a certain mystique to the fact that this table, this chair is so coveted on a Friday lunch, but yet we don't take reservations. It's a 115 year old tradition. It's first come first serve. So over the years, what happened is people would queue up on the sidewalk, come in, get here early to make sure that they're securing their table. Well, one-upsmanship came into play and you know, somebody started showing up at 11 o'clock for the 11.30 seating, then 10.30, then 9.30, then nine o'clock. Before you knew it, uh, they were paying proxies to stand in line. And that tradition still exists today. New Orleanians live. They have that, that, that joie de vivre that is so special. And when you are coming up on a holiday, it really resonates in the dining room at Galatoire's. The Friday before Mardi Gras is one of the most festive days of the year. It's lots of friends, it's lots of, of uh, groups of people that have a certain affiliation, but they're all here to celebrate Mardi Gras. They're all here to celebrate the way of life in New Orleans. Galatoire's is 
a part of the fabric of New Orleans in that sense. It, it really ties it all together. It's where people come to see one another and enjoy the holiday and celebrate. And so people were getting in line three days early to secure a table on the Friday before Mardi Gras and the Friday before Christmas. We began doing an auction and we auctioned the tables off. And all of the money collected in the auction goes to local charities. And from 2006 to present, we have contributed uh, through the passion and loyalty of our customers, uh, we've contributed well over $2 million to local charities in that 14 year period. It's an amazing, amazing thing. They say, if the shoe fits, wear it. But with this all female Mardi Gras crew, not all shoes are meant to be worn. Muses, named after the nine daughters of Zeus in Greek mythology, and after several of the streets that cross St. Charles on the parade route, like Melpomene, or Melpomene, Calliope, or Calliope, or Terpsichore, or Terpsichore, it's New Orleans. You can pronounce them any way you want. Well, this parade is one of the most beloved parades in all of Carnival. From the elaborate decorated floats to the playful costumes, these ladies just know how to please a crowd. But what sets this crew apart from all the rest are their highly coveted signature throws, which always includes, yep, yeah, that's right, glittery, fabulous, hand-decorated shoes. I prefer a high heel pump myself. Stick around and see why these shoes have people screaming, throw me something, sister. Stacy called and said, if I start a parade, do you want to be in it? And I said, Stacy, that's not really how it works. But she was so determined to do something different and she's so unbelievably passionate about it that she just knocked down every wall in her way and created this unbelievable crew. Our crew started in 2000. And so we're pretty young by the standards of a lot of the crews of New Orleans. We really filled a void in New Orleans and we kind of didn't know there was a void. It was just something where I thought, boy, it would be great to be in a parade. And that was in 2000 and I couldn't really think of one even though there are about 35 parades in the city of New Orleans and a lot of others in the surrounding area. When Stacy first came up with the idea of a carnival crew, for all women, a lot of crazy names got thrown around. There's nine streets in New Orleans that cross the parade route that are named for the nine muses. They're the daughters of Zeus and Mnemosyne, who's the goddess of memory. They inspire the arts and sciences, and Mardi Gras is really just a giant rolling art show. So it seemed so perfect that we wanted to be an inspiration to other women. It was very important to me and to the core group who formed muses to do something that was much more diverse and we just decided let's make it all women. There are plenty of opportunities for only men and there are other parades, but none of them rolled at night. And nighttime on the parade route is kind of the most exciting to me. You got to have things light up. It's kind of like what the big boys do. And we just thought we're gonna have a parade for women at night. We usually roll with 30 floats in our parade. Our signature floats are the big giant 17 foot tall fiber optic shoe, which was one of our first signature floats. The sirens float because you end the parade with sirens, sort of a joke, and the sirens were cast out by the muses. And then um, the goddessy. The goddessy is the officer's float. It's the most recent float made. So muses is known for our philanthropic work. We started a foundation in 2005, and we work very closely with many, many different groups, mainly working with charities that aid women and children. I've had so many people say what makes muses so different is when the crowd hears the enthusiasm of the people coming on the float, riding on the floats. There's just a love of it and a passion for it that I don't think anybody else has. We are blessed. We have an amazing group of women. It's a team effort and we've been kind of a fan favorite. We've been voted number one parade. We don't take it for granted. Every year is gonna be better and we want people to come and see how great it is. Having been here for 10 years, New Orleans um, is home. New Orleans is a place that has embraced me and I've tried to embrace the city. Mardi Gras, 
to me was just something that you read about on the West Coast. Being a part of the city, coming down 10 years ago, you learn about you know the greasing of the poles, the floats, uh, the time that goes into it, the, the people that are part of it. You learn about the traditions, you learn about uh, the celebrations, uh, and you're going to learn about king cakes. I'm here because Son of a Saint helps me succeed in my life. I'm here because I believe in my fellow brothers. I'm here because the people in Son of a Saint care about me. I'm here because I have the opportunity to make good friends. I am here because my son deserves a chance. Yo estoy aquí por mis hijos, por el futuro de ellos. I am here because my son may be fatherless, but he is not hopeless. We are here because there's a need that cannot be ignored. Help us affect more lives across New Orleans. It started with Edgar Dookie Chase Sr., and that was in 1939. And that was the begin, the begin, and everything started to waltz together for our family. Miss Leah as a person, you know, she was loving, enduring, but very strong. My mother said, well, I don't know what talent I have, but I can cook. Well, that was it. So my mother cooked. She never stopped. Even at 93, 94, it was always creative. What can we do? Can we do this one different? You know, there was no charity event that she wouldn't do. And sometimes it would amaze me. We would go to an event and they would say, you got to feed 2,000. And it would just be me and her. And she was like, not a problem. Let's get cooking. So it's, it's just her love for food, her love for people, uh, and, and that passion is really why I think people recognize her as the queen of Creole cuisine. When I look in the kitchen, I see fifth generation. When I look on the flow, fifth generation. At those cashiers, fifth generations. Leah Chase's gumbo. And, you know, in grandmother's own words, that conversations happen, ideas were exchanged. And by that simple interaction, that the gumbo changed America. Because she felt that she could change the whole world over a cup of gumbo. Come on into my restaurant and I'm gonna give you a bowl of gumbo and we're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk and we're gonna find that common ground. And of course, when the community came together during civil rights time and needed a place to be, our doors were open and many secret meetings took place upstairs. Well, you know, we need to be able to service the community that's coming in. When the African American did not have a place to cash their checks, well, all of a sudden, we were cashing checks because that is what the community needed. It was for all the people in the community to come in. So Ducky Chase has always been known back in the day, even when it was illegal, to bring in a diverse group of people. So that was always their motto. How can we affect change? How can we impact this community, this world for the better? To come to Ducky's wasn't just to come to any restaurant. You were coming again into her home. Doesn't matter what race, culture you are, you are welcome here because that is what our, really our goal of our grandparents and parents were, to make everyone feel comfortable and welcome at Dookie Chase's restaurant. Can't have Mardi Gras without king cake. You can't have Mardi Gras without the music itself because it kind of ups the level of happiness and ecstasy and the party. We're really lucky here at the Jazz Museum. We're, we're located right between the French Market and Frenchman Street. And it's also a place where a lot of the um, Mardi Gras parades run right around our building. You know, we have artifacts and items from, you know, many of the greats from, uh, from Professor Longhair, Al Carnival, Tom Johnson, the Nevilles, all of whom created the, music, the musical soundtrack that we listen to for Mardi Gras, and those are here in this building. Jazz is important because, one, it's a beautiful artistic expression of people and individuals. It comes out of the American experience, one of the more direct uh, representations of who we are as a country. Uh, it brings in a little bit of whomever plays it, no matter where you're from or who you are or what your personality is. Jazz music is a living, breathing art form. You're always in the moment. And, you know, before the pandemic, we took those kind of moments for granted. You know, just take it for granted. Oh, this is another gig. But now we cherish each, each and every gig that we have. Each and every time we have a chance to play, play with each other, uh, get on the bandstand, and we cherish those moments. It's one of the main currents of rock and roll. Uh, a lot of the early players who recorded at Cosmo's studio and j and studios in the 50s were jazz players. Yeah, and that's, that's part of our mission. 
cont help continue these traditions to support it in whatever way we can. Now we're doing, uh, we're streaming six days a week, sometimes two or three concerts a day. We're trying to keep busy and, and keep, um, keep the music alive as best we can. We still have exhibits that are going on that we're working on. We've opened a couple since the pandemic. We'll be opening a couple more in, in March and April and stuff. So we're working within the parameters that we got to work within and trying to keep everybody safe. <laughs> yes, music and Mardi Gras go hand in hand. It's a wonderful experience for those of you who've never experienced Mardi Gras. You owe it to yourself when the pandemic is over to come on down to New Orleans and check it out. Get rid of that never-ending on-hold music. Take away the financial jargon. The upselling, the down-talking. Lose the big city attitude. Lose the one-size-fits-all approach. Get rid of the sneaky fees. What do you have left? A banking experience that's streamlined. Local. Personable. The bank I actually want. At B1 Bank, our dedication to simplification has earned us many happy clients. We invite you to be one. B1 Bank. Be uncomplicated. Happy Mardi Gras. I'm Rebecca Miller with Smoothie King. We are so happy to be a part of your Mardi Gras celebration. Smoothie King was founded in New Orleans in 1973. Our roots are deep in the area and Mardi Gras festivities are part of our tradition. From when we blended our first smoothie to help meet gas nutrition goals, to today with our entire menu free of artificial colors, flavors, or preservatives, we have been committed to only serving the highest quality and best tasting smoothies to be a part of your health and fitness journey. In 2014, we partnered with New Orleans NBA team, the Pelicans, to unveil the Smoothie King Center. We are proud to have our name on this epicenter of New Orleans sports and entertainment. To further our mission to inspire people to live a healthy and active lifestyle, we sponsor the Challenge Athletes Foundation. CAF provides opportunities to support people with physical challenges so they can pursue active lifestyles. They support people like New Orleans native Ray Speedy Walker. Speedy is a lifelong basketball player. His life was changed in April 2020 when he was in a car accident and lost his mom and aunt. The accident also partially severed his spinal cord and put him in a wheelchair. Speedy wants to continue his love of basketball, but basketball wheelchairs are custom made to fit the player and are not covered by insurance. Today at the Smoothie King Center, Speedy thinks he's getting a tour, but Smoothie King and CAF have come together with a great Mardi Gras surprise for Speedy with some help from our friends with the New Orleans Pelicans. Hey Speedy, it's Zion Williamson of the New Orleans Pelicans. I know how much you love the game of basketball, and I know an accident last year changed your life. On behalf of Smoothie King and Challenge Athlete Foundation, we would like to gift you a Per 4 Max basketball chair and a signed basketball and jersey by me. Once again, I hope you like the gifts. Keep living your dream and go Pels. Let's go. Yeah, okay, see. This opportunity that Speedy gets to get this wheelchair is something that's just gonna keep him working towards his, his independence and it's gonna make him stronger. Definitely is gonna bring a lot of joy to his life. I'm just lost for words right now. Being paralyzed, I thought my life uh, was over. But receiving this, I'm able to continue to play basketball. You get paralyzed, uh, you know, any other injury, don't stop. You keep going and do, do what you love to do. I wanna give a special shout out to the Challenge Atlee's Foundation, Smoothie King, and the New Orleans Pelicans for uh, giving me hope and just blessing me with this chair. Love y'all. My name is Jimmy Lamarie, owner of La Uses by the Track. Started out as a grocery store before World War II. We're known for our poor boys and gumbo. But we do sell a lot more poor boys than anything else. It's our specialty. When Jazz Fest is on, there's no telling what celebrity will come and eat here. We're like headquarters for Jazz Fest. It's a street party the whole time. 
the neighborhood. It's been around for over 100 years. So is the racetrack, so we're kind of tied together. A poor boy is a, uh, it's a local sandwich made on French bread. You get anything on a poor boy you want. We'll put French fries on it if you want. Well, over the years, we've tried many different kind of mayos, and it's the basis, it's what you start with. Blue plate just turned out to be more creamy and texture's better. Eat to live, I think it's more like live to eat. I don't think any other city can duplicate what we have. If you're hungry in New Orleans, you better come see me. If you want a good meal. How's that? Inspired by our motto, not for oneself, but for one's own. We're leading the way. We're creating opportunities. We're transforming campus. We're joining our neighbors. As Tulaneans, we are defined by our relentless pursuit of a better tomorrow. The mystic crew of Femme Fatale was the first crew founded by African-American women for African-American women. And today, all women are welcome to join in the fun, which includes bedazzling their own signature throws of beautiful, hand-decorated compact mirrors. And now, here are the lovely ladies of Femme Fatale. My name is Dr. Takesha Charles Davis, and I am the current president and captain of the Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale. Mardi Gras is the epitome of New Orleans. It is the celebration of the culture that we bring together, everything from our Mardi Gras Indians, our children along St. Charles and Orleans Avenue watching parades, to those of us who have the pleasure and the opportunity uh, to ride on floats. It is the greatest free celebration on earth. Uh, and the Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale uh, is such a unique part of Mardi Gras. I'm Gwendolyn Victoria Rainey. I am the founder and the visionary of the Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale. Mardi Gras means to me, it's, it's like a gumbo that we have in New Orleans. It calls for all people, all cultures, people from all walks of life to come together to a free party and just enjoy our city and enjoy all the cultures that we have here in the city. My name is Michelle Cooper Rotney, and I am the Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale's Queen for 2020. The Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale was established in 2013 by the vision of our founder, Gwendolyn. Her vision has led us as women to come together and be so instrumental in the community so that we can not only impress upon young ladies, but also our community leaders and those within our community of how important it is to recognize the beauty within all people. The Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale in the beginning was formulated to be a part of Mardi Gras and provide an opportunity uh, for women of all creeds and colors. But as it has grown, we have become more than a Mardi Gras crew. And not only do we participate in community engagement activities, but we started our future FEMS. We found that there were young girls, black and brown, who wanted to learn about Mardi Gras. So not only do we have them ride on floats with us, but we teach them about the culture of Mardi Gras. We teach them etiquette. And so our group has grown. So our doors are open to uniqueness and creativity. Uh, we're the only parade crew that every float has the same costume. However, the headpieces are different and it is uh, centered around the theme for the parade that year. The crew's presence has changed since the establishment of the organization in 2013 from 52 ladies to 855 strong career independent stay-at-home moms, ladies of all aspects. Not only are they instrumental in the community and have different backgrounds, but they are also the ladies that you see out there in the community working hard in order to improve the welfare of our city of New Orleans. The Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale is more than a Mardi Gras crew. 
and we pride ourselves on partnering with community organizations and philanthropies around the city of New Orleans. Also make sure that our kids are healthy and have a partnership with LSU School of Medicine to provide physicals. We have free haircuts for those who might need them, as well as other opportunities for kids to receive services prior to going to school. In addition, we've most recently partnered with the City of New Orleans Health Department to provide free flu vaccinations to community members and hopefully prepare for a mass distribution of COVID-19 vaccines as we fight our current pandemic. The Mystic Crew of Femfatel has afforded so many people the opportunity to look within themselves, to see the inner beauty as well as the outer beauty that lives within them. So we're on the rise with just being unique and being creative in our own philanthropy and the things that we're gonna give back to the community. Have you tasted Lafayette? Home to the very best Cajun and Creole and everything that's hot. And by hot, we mean cool in cuisine. The gateway to world famous Louisiana seafood. Caught fresh daily in the Gulf of Mexico. And home to amazing chefs serving up delectable dishes daily. You'll find it all here. Cajun, Creole, acclaimed, undiscovered, spicy, delicate, white linen, paper napkin. Get to Lafayette and taste what you've been missing. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you in part by Crystal Hot Sauce, how New Orleans does flavor. Did you know that New Orleans played an instrumental role during World War II? Well, we did. The Higgins boats that carried our soldiers ashore on D-Day were manufactured right here in New Orleans. And that's why the National World War II Museum is located right here in the Crescent City. Now, during the war, Official Mardi Gras festivities were forced to be canceled for several years. But of course, nothing could stop New Orleanians from celebrating. Here's more from the World War II Museum. We opened June 6, 2000 as the D-Day Museum um, almost immediately based on feedback from visitors, from veterans, and the actions of our Board of Trustees, we decided that we were going to take on the whole story of World War II and actually are designated by an act of Congress as America's National World War II Museum. So when you come to visit the museum now, uh, you learn about how we got into the war in the first place in the, the lead up to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, you learn about the contributions of the home front, which were so instrumental to our success. We have galleries dedicated to all of the war in Europe and the Pacific. Um, we have a restoration pavilion for our artifacts. We have an education center. We have a live entertainment venue that brings forward just magnificent programs from the 1940s. So it is really a very comprehensive, immersive experience that gives you really a full appreciation of World War II and its impact on our country, uh, and really the entire world. During World War II, Americans all over the country were asked to do without, to do without certain things, to undergo rationing, to do without um, coffee, sugar, gasoline. Here in New Orleans, folks were also asked to do without Mardi Gras. There were still parties and balls and dances, but they all took on a patriotic flair. There's actually images of Uncle Sam and Lady Liberty as the king and queen of Carnival. So in 1943, for instance, there was a, a giant bond drive and concert on Canal Street in between Barone and Carondelet. The city set up a, a giant uh, bandstand, and there were several bands that played that day. And the city raised over a million dollars in war bonds. And we do have some evidence in the collection that New Orleanians who were serving overseas did celebrate Mardi Gras. One of the stories in particular is from the 24th General Hospital, and that was a hospital unit that was based out of Tulane University. And in 1944 and 1945, when they were serving overseas, they did hold Mardi Gras balls. So they called themselves the Mystic Crew of Snafu. And Snafu is, of course, chaos, or situation normal all fouled up. 
And so they, they really played on that. And it's similar in, in character to what you might see in Crew de Vue, you know, very um, satirical costumes with some of the doctors and nurses even dressing up as Mussolini and Hitler. So you see, you know, the, the war-themed costumes even overseas while the war is going on. So the first Mardi Gras after World War II was in 1946. Many servicemen and women were just returning home, so it took a long time for those serving to be discharged and to be brought back to the United States. So by Mardi Gras, a lot of people were really just getting back from the war. So it was a really fantastic time. I know March 9th when we first got our first patient and then throughout the next few months, while we were seeing a lot of our patients go home, we were also seeing some people not so fortunate. And now that we actually have a vaccine, the mood has really shifted like there's hope. We have hope, we can take a deep breath, we can see a light at the end of the tunnel for eradicating this disease. To have this vaccine and the hope um, that comes with this vaccine is truly amazing. Um, it couldn't come soon enough, honestly. We really want to encourage everybody to get this vaccine so that we don't see people in the hospital anymore. I think everybody's seen the number of people that are dying. I mean, every day, we've lost over 350,000 Americans. That's September 11 every day for 100 days. We don't need to go through that. But the important thing is to prevent people from even coming in. And this is the one way we can do it with the vaccine. When I got the vaccine the first time, everybody almost paid attention to everything that I was doing because they wanted to know, you know, if I was having any side effects. And, um, but they see me now, I, I feel good. I'm acting like my normal self. And that's encouraged them, even my family. They're more eager to get in now. This is a tremendous weight off of my shoulders because I, I've seen firsthand how devastating uh, the coronavirus can be to people and their families. And because of that, my family has been very, very careful to the point where this is the closest I've been to my mom since the beginning of March. And for my mom to be able to get the coronavirus vaccine at this point, 
is so emotional for me because I will finally be able to give her a hug and my son will be able to give her a hug. And so I think that in the end, on a personal level, it's just, it, it, it's, it's so amazing for me. All right, bye, Ma. I love you. I think there's a lot of understandable uh, concern. Um, a lot of people have asked questions around how fast this vaccine became available. Uh, people have asked questions around the science behind the vaccine. I think we just live in an era where there's a lot of information, some of it wrong out there, some of it a little bit misleading. Social media, the news, politics, all that affect um, how people perceive this. Um, and it's challenging for us being nurses and being physicians, and we have to almost try to overcome that. So I think the more people that look like me are out here on camera, um, just showing everybody that this is okay and we could do this, I think that that's gonna change things around. If we care about each other, we care about our families, we care about our community, it's the one thing we can do to be able to help each other and move, move this, just let's get past this. We want our lives back and this is the one way to get there. I don't even speak this language, but I feel like I've got some sense of it. Achafalaya Basin. Achafalaya Basin? Achafalaya? Achafalaya. Achafalaya Basin. I know it's difficult when you look at it, but it's pronounced Achafalaya Basin, and it's a large body of water that runs in the south central part of the state of Louisiana, and it actually empties into the Gulf of Mexico. Maurepas. Marupas. Morapas. Morepas. Moripas. Morepas. It's pronounced Marapa. The S is silent, and it's a body of water just west of Lake Pontchartrain. Rigolet. 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 Riglets. Rigolese, Rigolese. It's a deep water strait that connects Lake Pontchartrain with the Gulf of Mexico. Opelousas. I'm going to say Opelousas. 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 It is a beautiful city west of Baton Rouge, which is west of New Orleans. Crawfish. Crayfish. Crawfish. Crawfish. Ah, crawfish. Delicious crawfish. If you're invited to a crawfish boil, Take the invitation. You will not regret it. A Sazerac. 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 It's a great drink. It's also a great lounge at the Waldorf Astoria Roosevelt New Orleans Hotel. So when you come to New Orleans, go to the Sazerac Bar at the Roosevelt and have a Sazerac drink. Kachita Parish? Kachita Parish? Oh, Achita Parish? Alchita, Wichita. Maybe it's Wichita. Wachita Parish. A Wachita Parish. A Wachita Parish. Terrebonne Parish. Terrebonin. Terrebonne Parish. Terrebonne. Terrebonne. Terrebonne Parish, just southwest of New Orleans. Homa, Thibodeau, two great cities in Terrebonne Parish that you can visit when you come to Louisiana. Hey, Mardi Gras fans, feeling thirsty? Smoothie King is offering free delivery through February 20th, 21. To order, visit smoothieking.com slash order. In Louisiana, there is another Mardi Gras, a wilder, more visceral Mardi Gras. Far from the streets of New Orleans, in Cajun country, they celebrate a Mardi Gras little changed from those celebrated by their French peasant ancestors in medieval times. To the ever-present strain of music, the people of Acadiana keep their unique culture alive. The Acadiana region covers 22 parishes full of bayous, rice paddies, and sugarcane fields in southwest Louisiana with the beating heart of Acadiana and its largest city of Lafayette, Louisiana. And in that heart there remains the French language, a love of life, and a longing. A longing for the lost land of Acadie, modern Nova Scotia from which the Acadians were forcibly removed in 1763 following the French defeat in the Seven Years' War. Forced to settle where no one else wanted to amongst the mosquitoes and swamps, their ancestors, along with a mix of Native Americans and other cultures, created the distinct culture, the Cajun culture. And alongside the Cajuns, the Creoles, black, French-speaking descendants of freed slaves and other people of color. For the days and weeks before Mardi Gras, families and communities come together to celebrate with music, food, and dancing. Far from the grand balls and black ties of New Orleans, the Cajun Fado Do, as these parties are called, 
are small gatherings in backyards and fields among friends. The Cajun music of the Acadians and the Zydeco music of the Creoles rings out as ever present at these celebrations as the iconic black cast iron gumbo pot. In Cajun and Creole's Mardi Gras, gone are the floats, and in their place is the Career de Mardi Gras, or the Mardi Gras run for the Cajuns, and the trail ride among the Creoles. In the Cajun tradition, the Career de Mardi Gras features homemade costumes. These costumes are distinctive and ancient. Designed by the Cajuns' ancestors in medieval France to mock the fancy clothes of their aristocratic betters and the cardinals of the Catholic Church and princes of the realm. It is these medieval-inspired costumes that give Cajun Mardi Gras its otherworldly look. Once dressed, the run begins. The run is a wild, rolling party in search of the ingredients for a gumbo. As the run progresses, each home they visit provides food, drinks, or other donations in return for a show or spectacle to earn the ingredients. Often that donation is a chicken, which the revelers must catch barehanded amongst the mud and ditches. In Cajun Mardi Gras, participants don't watch the spectacle. The participants are the spectacle, the Mardi Gras. Of the event, celebrity chef Anthony Bourdain said, house to house they will go, bringing mirth, mockery, and mayhem. To be sure, Cajun Mardi Gras is, as it has always been, a moment for hardworking people to let loose and live life, to celebrate with friends and family, to eat, to drink, and to remember what it is to be an Acadian. How do I look? You like the duds? This costume I found in my mom's attic, and it actually belonged to my grandfather, Harry Bat Sr., when he reigned as the king of the Knights of Hermes in 1955. And I've worn it almost every Mardi Gras since. Named after the winged messenger of the gods in Greek mythology, Hermes has been rolling through uptown New Orleans since their first parade in 1938. They're known for their visually stunning floats and, of course, their signature wing throws. Stay tuned for more on the history of Hermes. To me, Mardi Gras is a celebration about everything New Orleans, everything that's special about New Orleans. Mardi Gras is the one time of the year where everybody in the city comes together, regardless of whether they're rich, poor, race, creep, anything. Everyone comes together during one celebration to celebrate the same thing. Our crew was formed in 1937. It came about with a number of local businessmen, doctors, lawyers, looking at the, the struggle of the city after the Great Depression. They thought it would be a good idea to create another carnival organization that would help bridge the, the Mardi Gras festivities on, on actual Mardi Gras Day and actually create a longer carnival to help bring in tourism, to help recover uh, from the Great Depression by giving more uh, commerce to the, the city of New Orleans. Hermes got its name from, it was suggested by F. Edward Bear, who was a reporter with the New Orleans State's newspaper at the time, who ultimately became a congressperson from the city of New Orleans. He suggested the name because Hermes was the god of commerce and the protector of travelers. We think that the original crew consisted of between 150 and 200 members. Now the crew has expanded to exceed 800 members, so that's four times greater. And what we like to claim is that our crew has been able to grow into four times as large and yet still maintain that smaller parade, the traditional parade feel of the Friday night before Mardi Gras, uh, a parade that still depicts traditional Mardi Gras uh, in a way that many generations can relate to. We've really bridged sort of a divide between the, the older New Orleans parades and some of the newer parades. Hermes is a very traditional crew. It's not a super crew, it's a very traditional crew, and yet it hasn't been afraid to introduce some new things into Mardi Gras, such as neon lighting on floats, uh, the lighted costumes with the H on the front. We always have a foot back in the traditional Mardi Gras uh, appeal of the parade. Uh, so, and I think that's what makes Hermes unique, is that we're able to cover all of that and still leave the crowd with a sense of what Mardi Gras is all about. What's unique about our crew is the civic-minded nature of our members. The first question they usually ask is, what can we do to help? 
for example, this Mardi Gras, um, we're gonna make a donation to the New Orleans Police Department to send some of their senior officers to training um, at Northwestern in Chicago. It usually doesn't begin with how do we put on a better party, it's what can we do for the community. When I think of Mardi Gras, I think of family. In our crew and in many of the crews across the city, we're generational and it's what keeps Carnival going. Uh, we've got grandfathers, fathers, you know, sons, grandsons, all, all part of the crew, and that's what sustains Carnival in New Orleans, I believe. I think that it becomes a fabric of our community that our generations upon generations are continuing to celebrate the Carnival season. Each day, New Orleans adds another chapter to this love story we all call home. And while each of our verses is our own, it's what we share in common that makes our culture so strong, like the rhythmic roll of a boiling pot, the delicate gliss of ice dancing in a glass, the steady backbeat of a kitchen in motion, and the glorious sizzle when it all comes together. These are the ties that bind us, those moments that give life both meaning and joy. So to all you cooks, bakers, and backyard chefs, we say keep on keeping on. Your aromas, tastes, and family recipes keep this city vibrant and alive. Here in New Orleans, the visual arts are an integral part of everyday life. The city has long been home to a community of celebrated artists who find inspiration in their surroundings. From museums, galleries, and studios, to elaborate murals and public sculptures, you can take in exceptional works of art just about anywhere. Here's more of the experts at Arthur Rogers Gallery. The art scene in New Orleans is different than any place. I think that if you ask an artist, a prominent artist, to show in many major cities, they would ask questions like, how well you think it's gonna do, or, or what can, what, what's your expectation? You know, you say, would you like to do a show in New Orleans? And they go, oh God, yes, I'd love to do a show in New Orleans. You know, when we opened the gallery, I, I, I think, I felt like we knew everybody in the, in, the art business, the art artists in New Orleans. Now I don't feel like I know anyone. I mean, it's just so big, it's so vast, and it's grown so much. And it's really incredibly exciting because, I mean, that's what we're all working for. You know, there's a, a very rich history of Southern art, and that has continued to this day. There was something unique about New Orleans art. You know, there was something that was different than what you would see in major art centers. And you have art that's being influenced by Mardi Gras and you have Mardi Gras, which is imitating art through listening to artists like Ida Kohlmeier talking about the influence of color on the work. Mythology, you know, with uh, George Duro, for example, the fascination and the sort of rooted history of mythology in Mardi Gras. You know, growing up in New Orleans, of course, I'm very familiar with the Mardi Gras Indians and uh, have a great reverence for, for, for what they do and the pageantry and the beauty of the work that they do. And I went to Jazz Fest and there was, you know, the artist craft booths and Damon Molossa was there, Chief Molossa. And uh, he was beating and he was making these portraitures which were intended to be objects that you would purchase at Jazz Fest. And it was a very exciting moment for me because these windows open and close in the art world and that was definitely one. Immediately asked Damon to do a show if he was interested in doing this that I wanted to help him. You know, I wanted to be a part of this and asked him to do a show and we, we pretty much hit it off from the very first moment. Being, being a Mardi Gras Indian in New Orleans is everything for youth, for me as a youth, and it's brought uh, a lot of love to our community throughout the years of me being living. And I started being in 1992. Uh, I learned how to be from an elder Indian. His name is Ferdinand Bigard Sr. He was the chief of the uh, Cheyenne Warriors. The big chief is the, the, the uh, 
leader of the neighborhood, like a father of the neighborhood. So my chief had became my, my lifeline. His name, everybody in the city called him Papa. Papa uh, gave me a, a butterfly and showed me how to sew from a butterfly. And I bead from 5.30 in the morning to at least 12.30, take a break, go to Bywater Bakery if I can, or make me some more coffee, and I sew from 5.30 until about 12.30 at night. You have to know how to do the technique of drawing and beading and the storytelling in the suits. The storytelling has to make sense and it can't be uh, some old just made up thing about our community. So most of the times I, I come up with the African diaspora uh, and study where we coming from to know where we are going. I'm a, I'm a painter with the beads. And what I want them to get is, I come from a, a lost culture that, that people don't see unless you come to New Orleans for Mardi Gras. And through the, the portraiture and taking it out of masking in my suits, I want them to see this as artistry and what it really is. So I poured the concrete that, that sits in front of this building right now. I poured, I worked for Hard Rock Construction and I remember pouring the street in front of this building. That year, I think I was beating this suit right here, uh, Bra Coupe. So uh, I said one day, I'll be able to walk in there, not knowing I'll be in here, you know, as an artist, as a contemporary artist. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what I usually used to do. I used to bead in the evening times. So this suit, I, I pour concrete 365 days and in the morning, 5.30 get off 5.30, come on 5.30, and bead until like 2, 3 in the morning. New Orleans is, is, a, is, a, big, is a big part of gumbo. The people uh, leaving out my house and seeing the, the shotgun houses, uh, the old lady leaving out her house with her basket, going with her little dog, walking to the bakery. In the Bywater where I live at right now, that's where I come from all my life, so it's like waking up being born again. So. Um, New Orleans is everything for my art and for Mardi Gras Indian. Um, just as a way of life, New Orleans is everything. I need to clear something up about New Orleans. While our culinary scene might be on fire, our food has never been about heat. It's always been about flavor. And this is how New Orleans does flavor. Are we clear? Crystal, how New Orleans does flake. It should have been impossible, crossing the world's widest ocean, to answer an attack made by a powerful adversary. From island to island to island, we fought through hostile terrain, malnutrition, disease, and at every step, an enemy that just kept coming. It should have been impossible. Find out how millions of Americans pushed past impossible on the road to Tokyo, new at the National World War II Museum. This song right here is entitled My People and is out right now on all streaming platforms. Y'all can also follow us on all social media platforms. It's Chawa Bang. Chawa!
rich people still living high and dry. Poor people only watching the waters rise. Watching the waters rise. Most people don't even bat an eye. But my people know that it's real this time. Oh yeah. to Treme, because Treme uh, is one of the oldest African-American neighborhoods in New Orleans. And Dizzy's, uh, the Bakke family, has been in the restaurant business over 60 years. This restaurant means a lot to me because it's named after my one of my grandkids, Zachary Bakke. Uh, his nickname is Lil Dizzy. He plays the trumpet, and that's his nickname, and that's who I named it after. Well, the reason we decided to invest into reopening Lil Dizzy's is because it's our Bakke family legacy. When my father-in-law decided to retire back in November, my husband Wayne and I took some time and we thought about it, we prayed on it, and we decided we wanted the Bakke legacy to continue. And as you can see, uh, Eddie Bakke, who started this legacy, uh, we wanted to just continue it and be able to pass it on to our children. Lil Dizzy's mean, great Creole soul food, period. It's in the heart of Treme. They have other restaurants in Treme, but nothing like Lil Dizzy's. We are excited and looking forward to when Mardi Gras resumes because I am a huge fan of Mardi Gras all my life. And I became a crew member of the Mystic Crew of Femme Fatale, where I am a co-lieutenant. And so I can't wait to ride again, but I wanna be able to offer catering to all of the Mardi Gras crews uh, when they start hosting their balls and their functions when Mardi Gras resumes. So we have our uh, potato salad. Um, that looks yummy, I can't wait to have that. We also have our jambalaya. And in our jambalaya, we have our homemade hot sausage. It's a bake recipe. Um, and then the best part of today's lunch, we have our amazing fried chicken. Up next, we have an incredible performance by legendary local musicians who have made history right here in New Orleans. The Meters are considered to be one of the founding fathers of funk, and they are synonymous with Mardi Gras music. 
Their unique sound blends traditional rhythm and blues with funk and jazz and, of course, New Orleans soul. A musical mainstay any time of the year, the meters are a must on any good Mardi Gras playlist. So, turn up the volume, get up and groove, shake what your mama gave you, and allow us to introduce the meters. The meters, I feel like this was a spiritual thing. These are four guys that was supposed to get together. Musically, we couldn't do no wrong. Everybody vibed off each other. You know, musically, if, if somebody does something, the other guy would jump on it and blah, blah, blah. I, I would say this, it was a match made in heaven. He came boogie now with a sister show will. You know, those first three, those first three records, it was just playing off each other. Neil would come in with an idea and we would refine it. You know, by the time we got to be a band in the studio, you know, it got refined, you know, because, you know, when we got to the studio, Alan Toussaint had kind of brought into the attention that it's not what you play, it's what you don't play that makes all this really happens really well. taught how to play classical music. You could be taught how to play jazz. You could be taught different kind of music. You could be, could be taught, but you can't be taught how to play funk. If it's not in you, forget it. Go do something else. It has to be within you. Funk is a thing that, that's, that's you, that's your character, that's you coming out. You know, nobody can teach that. New Orleans is just a special place, man. I'll put it like this. You know, you don't have uh, New York music or Los Angeles music or Milwaukee music, you know, but you have New Orleans music. I was living in LA and I would come here like four or five times a year. And uh, people would ask me, they'd say, uh, they say, Leo, they say, where you live? I say, well, um, I live in New Orleans, but I sleep in Burbank. Uh, you know, I'm honored by the fact that I got that Lifetime Achievement Award from the Grammy people. But um, I truly was more honored when um, Offbeat Magazine gave me my Lifetime Achievement Award. You know, get my Lifetime Achievement Award from home meant more to me. This was a match that was magical. It just was, it just was magical. You know, it wasn't planned or anything like that. It just, it just happened, you know, and if it wasn't supposed to happen, it wouldn't have happened. Well, New Orleans is built to host meetings, events, and special events. And the biggest part of that are our people. Our people are the reason why we're known for our authentic culture. It bleeds into our food, our music, our architecture. And so when you come to New Orleans, you're not just gonna get a PowerPoint, you're gonna have a culture and experience like you've had nowhere else in the country. Here at the Convention Center, we have tremendous amount of entertainment options, tremendous amount of wonderful world-class restaurants, opportunities for people to gather together. So the opportunity to interact and to be entertained and entertained is greater here than most any place in the world. You know, I've been in this industry for many years and the purpose to come together for conventions is really to talk about new products and about education and continuing education. So I would say the medical conferences are the ones that are most fascinating. Well, we've also had great success in partnering with our governor and with the legislature here in Louisiana to pass some legislation to make sure that companies, that corporations, that 
meeting planners and that those who are uh, planning events here in Louisiana know that they can safely do that. You know, before the pandemic, we were on a really aggressive renovation and expansion plan, and it started with the airport terminal at Louis Armstrong. It is beautiful, and so many people haven't had a chance to experience that. And then as you come into the city, you know, we're at the convention center now, and behind us is the new pedestrian park. It's beautiful, it's outdoor space, which is so important now, and you can host events and concerts and all kinds of outdoor things here. And so from our people to our culture to our food and music and the continuous need to improve, I think New Orleans is really well set to host meetings and events. It's a second home to me. It's a second home to my family. Um, we love the culture, the people, the music, the food, the sports. Um, it's just a special place. There's really very few places that I've been in America that are like New Orleans. Both of my sons still to this day are talking about Mardi Gras and Knox, my oldest, said it was the best day of his life. I have to say my favorite was Dong Fung uh, Bakery. That was, that was my favorite by far. The people, the people that live in New Orleans, the people that are from New Orleans, uh, the people that have moved to New Orleans, everybody sort of buys into um, the vibe and the ethos and is just so kind and, and have welcomed my family and myself and it's just a pleasure to be part of this community. My name is Peter Wynn. I'm chef and owner of Bummy Boys in Metairie, Louisiana. When you have the Vietnamese food culture and the New Orleans food culture, we both have French influence in our food. Our concept was to do po' boys and bun mi's side by side. And we also offer our fusion, which I like to integrate foods that I enjoy eating because I believe sandwiches are a blank canvas. Po' boy is a classic New Orleans sandwich that we have down here. It's usually fried seafood and dressed with lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, and mayonnaise. Mayo is important because it's one of those quintessential ingredients that makes the sandwich what it is. I use blue plate because it's just one of those ingredients I grew up on. Everything is high quality. Things I enjoy are music, art, and food. Here, I try to bring all that together. Our food is very bright, very flavorful, and it's a really a true integration of New Orleans and Vietnamese food culture. It doesn't matter if you're from here or from another state, another country, we have great food that brings people together. Iberia Bank and First Horizon are now one company. While we have grown, our strategy remains the same. We provide personalized financial solutions from a team that you know and trust while continuing to strengthen our community. We're looking forward to being better together. Hey, Brian and Mark, I hope you don't mind if I jump in because I'd love to introduce our next crew, the amazing women of the crew of Iris. Not only are they the oldest all-female crew, but Iris is special to my family because my great aunt, Amethyst Nungesser, started the crew back in 1917 with a ball. Then she was only 18 years old. These women began the parade in 1959, the year I was born. Some men didn't think women should be parading, and they harassed them, but that didn't stop them. Now some of the biggest and best crews are the all-female crews. Wow, how times have changed. Mardi Gras means to me happiness, excitement, family, friends. It's a time where New Orleans and everybody around the country gets together, and we celebrate. Through the years, the meaning of Mardi Gras has kind of changed a little bit. When I was a girl, it was being with my family and going from one parade to try to catch the next parade. And then post-Katrina, it was more of a, I want to be more involved. We were established in 1917. I can't tell you exactly the amount was in the first crew, but when my great aunt took it over, we, there was 50 members. So fast forward to 2021, we're now going strong at 3,400 members. 
Iris is unique because we are our oldest women's group, but we are still an old line crew, which means that we, our queen is still a secret until our coronation. We still have the maids and the full court with the opulent costumes. So our signature throw is the sunglasses. And the way we came up with that was we are a day parade. And you know we, we wanted something that we could decorate and use. So we can use our signature throw, which I think people really love. We have these massive floats now, double deckers, tandems that hold twice as many people as we've had. And to double our membership in just one year, you can imagine how that has kind of pushed us forward uh, and made us one of the premier parades. Friday before the parade is probably one of my most favorite days downtown. Everybody's in costume. You see the purple, green, and gold. You can't be too crazy that day. You can't dress too crazy. Um, everybody's just in such a good mood. Everybody's excited about that, that weekend and everybody's ready to start the party. So it's like a kickoff to the rest of the Mardi Gras season. We have just upgraded to 35 tandem floats. Um, and the one that is most iconic to me was actually what I call my float. Um, it's the Iris Garden and she is um, the first float to kick off our parade. It is the, uh, the goddess with her long blonde hair with irises everywhere and the tandem float is completely covered with our flower, the iris. And then of course following us is our tidal float with the winged goddess with her wings going and that's a beautiful float. We are 100 years old. We celebrated our centennial. We love every minute of it and hopefully we're going strong 100 more years. As one of the leading educational institutions in our country, Tulane University is renowned for its academic excellence, innovative research programs, and unwavering dedication to community engagement. At Tulane, you'll find some of the best and brightest minds in the world. After all, I am a graduate. Students come from all over to fuel their curiosity, learn from brilliant educators, and immerse themselves in our city's unique culture. A valuable history lesson in itself. Up next, more on Tulane from the experts who know it best. Tulane was particularly appealing for me because the research that I do focuses on disparities in, uh, in health, disparities by race, by economic status, by geography. And here you have a city, New Orleans, that is a major international city, but we're in a rural state, so you have a diversity of populations that suffer from the types of health problems that, I, that I'm concerned about. Tulane is the perfect balance of size and resources. We're a major global research university with expertise across a wide variety of areas, but a small enough university that you can interact with colleagues from all over campus working on very different types of projects. And that gives you an opportunity to bring together uh, people who are working on very different areas of research, but can combine those, those two areas to address problems that really uh, don't fit neatly into any one area of, of research. So we're able to have a problems-focused research agenda and not just a research agenda that's only focused on uh, discovery. One thing that this pandemic has shown us is that the research that we do at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine is vital for the seven billion people on the planet. We do work that helps us to understand how we can keep people safe, how we can improve people's health and protect people from threats. And I think it's important that people understand that at the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, we see ourselves as an important corporate citizen of this city, and we have a responsibility not only to the global communities that we focus on, but also responsibility right here at home to address the health concern concerns of New Orleans and the Gulf South in general. The vaccine provides us an opportunity to get back to some semblance of normality, to control this virus and allow us to coexist with COVID-19 the way that we coexist with influenza. Drink it in. Powerful, vibrant, nutrient-rich fuel for healthy, active, experience-rich lives. Each ingredient chosen carefully, every blend crafted masterfully. Nurturing your passion, nourishing your purpose. So you can be your best self, live your best life, 
and rule the day. I'm Alexis Hamilton, Tulane University, class of 2021, majoring in ecology and evolutionary biology. And I'm JC Pugel, Tulane University, class of 2021, majoring in neuroscience and music performance. And we're, we're the, the drum, drum majors, majors of the Tulane University, University Marching Band. Band. It's been a challenging year for the TUMB, but we have managed to find new mediums to share our performances with our audience, including unique virtual halftime performances in Yulman Stadium that were broadcast on our YouTube channel. This Mardi Gras, we may not have our parades, but the TUMB will bring the Green Wave spirit to the New Orleans community. We have a special performance for you tonight featuring the Tulane University Marching Band performing Mardi Gras repertoire in Yulman Stadium. Each year, the TUMB performs Mardi Gras standards like Ico Ico and the Saints Go Marching In, as well as a rotating song voted by the student membership. From our 2020 Mardi Gras season, Bad Guy by Billie Eilish was this song. The TUMB danced down the parade route in the crew of Pontchartrain and the crew of Orpheus in New Orleans and in the Mystics of Time Parade in Mobile. Performing for millions of Mardi Gras revelers along the way, the member voted song always features choreography by the captains of the Tulane Shockwave Dance Team. Thanks for watching and marching with us virtually. Please visit us at TulaneBand.org to see more Mardi Gras content and follow us on social media at Tulane U-Band. Happy, Happy Mardi, Mardi Gras, Gras and roll, roll wave! wave. I'm Constantine Georges and I'm the founder and uh, co-owner of Dat Dog in New Orleans. Well, Dat Dog originated uh, uptown by Tulane University on Ferret Street. And I grew up uptown when I was a young uh, student at Tulane. And my partner at the time also grew up uptown. And, we, and that neighborhood is very central to the uptown community. Frenchman Street is the epicenter of the good music that's being played in New Orleans. It's only two blocks long, but I've been coming to Frenchman Street way before I owned that dog to go to Cafe Brazil, where you would meet people like Joni Mitchell or Jimmy Buffett, uh, just hanging out there in the restaurants or the bars. Well, traditionally, the way we incorporated uh, music in uh, that dog is that we opened the windows and the doors to our place because the music on Frenchman was all on the streets and outside. Sadly though, when COVID hit, 
all of that dried up. The bars were not allowed to open like they used to. The clubs were not allowed to open. But we were allowed to open because we were a restaurant. And having a nice balcony, we decided to put a baby grand piano on the balcony, very distant from the people, but we kept the music alive. And that was the idea, is to keep the music alive throughout the pandemic. We are a combination of European meets New Orleans. We have sausages that came from Europe, Polish kielbasa, Slovenian sausage, Irish Guinness sausages. And then we teamed up with people like the Vokrasons to do their hot sausage, or alligator sausage, or the crawfish sausage, or the duck sausage. Unfortunately, after Katrina, our facility was ruined. And we haven't had a chance to go back into full-scale production to provide our products on the retail level. What we did do was maintain our presence in the food vending concessions market at our local festivals. These festivals have allowed us to keep our brand out there, as well as our participation in sales to local restaurants that have sold us for many years, including Dookie Chase Restaurant, who has bought our product for over 75 years. Miss Chase was a customer of my grandfather, and that loyalty has meant the world to us. But we make sure that now, as we move into this next generation, that we will soon be able to make our products available, not only back into the grocery stores, but we're also thankful to outlets like Dat Dog, who brought us in knowing that we wanted to get our brand back out into the marketplace, which allowed us to have our product presented as they grew, it allows us to grow. And I'm so thankful to the George's family for that opportunity. Now I want you to know something about this room that I'm, I'm giving the interview in. This is our crew of Chewbacca's uh, room. What does that mean? Well, you see the drunken Wookiee behind me, okay? But I had this idea years ago that we would try to do at Dat Dog what Antoine's did for the crew of Rex or the crew of Proteus. I said, we should have a room dedicated to those great carnival organizations that march along Frenchman Street. For next year's Mardi Gras, I gotta say, I'm really excited to have the people come all back to town. You know, during this time during COVID, it's been a little weird not having all the people from all over the world, but I'm really looking forward to getting all the tourists back into the city. Your adventure with family and friends begins in Jefferson Parish. Follow winding paths to discover the great outdoors, Shop sprawling malls or quaint boutiques. Sample savory cuisine, including the Louisiana Oyster Trail. Just click on Stay and Save at visitjeffersonparish.com. We've made health and safety a top priority, so book your stay and learn how your Jefferson Parish Hotel key can unlock deals and memories to last forever. So come take it easy. Just next to the Big Easy. <laughs> to the heroes who are working tirelessly to care for our communities, we thank you. We will never forget the countless hours you dedicated on the front lines, choosing to risk your own health to fight for our friends, neighbors, and family members. Does that mean you guys are out on the front lines uh, fighting it? Together, we are overcoming this adversity and make our state healthier and more vibrant again. Auctioner Health. Who that? I miss it. Who that, baby? <laughs> <laughs> There's a joy of life you'll find only in Louisiana. A spirit of celebration that takes your senses places they've never been before. Where expressions of joy are an art form and our way of life. Where an abundance of good food, good times, and great music means there's more than enough to go around. Come one, come y'all. Come feed your soul in Louisiana. I'm John Goodman inviting you to visit louisianatravel.com and plan your getaway today. One of the best things about New Orleans is our food. Yes, not only does it bring us all together, but it tells us about our history and those that came before us. Now, whether it's gumbo or red beans and rice, poor boys or beignets or king cakes, there's a story behind every traditional dish. And you can find many of them at classic New Orleans institutions. Joining us now is New Orleans food expert, Ian McNulty. I'm Ian McNulty and I cover food and food culture for the Times Picayune and the New Orleans Advocate.
think what people are really blown away about when it comes to New Orleans food is how interactive it is. Now, these are not just dishes that sit on menus or live in cookbooks. They're really part of the culture of New Orleans and the way that people interact with each other. You know, even our visitors, when they come to town, they get to really interact with this vivid part of New Orleans culture just by going to a restaurant, just go getting a po' boy. That's what makes it really exciting and unique. Anyone who's thinking about New Orleans restaurants, they're probably picturing an old, historic restaurant because we have so many that are so, so deeply rooted in this town. They have histories going back decades, even more than a century. What that does is it gives a sense of where the tradition comes from. You can go to these restaurants and it's not like visiting a museum where there's displays on the, on the shelf or behind the glass. These are places that give you history lessons on your plate, on your table, in your glass. We talk about the roles that New Orleans restaurants have within their communities. Dookie Chase's is a place that has a, a role that you cannot overstate in the entire community that is New Orleans. This place is a, a real showcase of what Creole flavor is about, traditional New Orleans Creole flavor, and also what New Orleans community is about. If you wanted to distill what makes New Orleans restaurants unique in one single meal, it has to be Friday lunch at Galatoire's. You walk in the doors and the party is on. There's so much energy in the room. It's the way that people are interacting at their tables, with the staff, with the tables next to them. It's the food. The food is traditional. It's old fashioned Creole cooking, but it's fresh and it's vibrant and there's so much butter and crab meat. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It's a big party and it shows you the exuberance that New Orleans people bring to their restaurants. One of the great things about New Orleans is the way that its neighborhoods are dotted with these restaurants, these corner joints that are just so important to community life. Willie Mae's Scotch House is a great example of that. It's a Treme restaurant that's been around for generations and it's grown and changed through the years, but it's always kept its soul. Antoine's isn't just unique among New Orleans restaurants. It's unique in all of American cuisine. This is the oldest continuously operated restaurant there is in New Orleans. It's been in the same family for over 175 years. That's huge. And this is a place that carries those traditions forward. When you dine in Antoine's, you look around and you're seeing family traditions being maintained, being refreshed in room after room. You can just go in there and take a look around this place and get a sense of Creole dining history in one meal. Anyone who comes to New Orleans and doesn't come away with an order of beignets and a cafe au lait from Cafe Du Monde is gonna have some explaining to do back home. That's just how famous and established this coffee stand in the French market is. Hi, I'm Chef Zach Miller. I'm the baking and pastry instructor here at the New Orleans Culinary and Hospitality Institute, otherwise known as Noki. And today we'll be making traditional New Orleans pralines. So to make our New Orleans pralines, we're gonna use whole milk, heavy whipping cream, granulated sugar, light brown sugar, unsalted butter, toasted chopped pecans, vanilla extract, and salt. Uh, first, we're gonna start off with our liquid ingredients, so our milk and our cream. Those are gonna go into our pot, along with our unsalted butter, and both of our sugars, our granulated sugar, and our light brown sugar. Uh, we're going to continue to cook this over high heat. And we're gonna cook this to uh, 237 degrees Fahrenheit. Once this comes to that temperature, we're then gonna add our chopped toasted pecans. So at this point, we have our mixture boiling. I'm going to check my temperature. I'm gonna monitor this until we get to the temperature that we need. I'm gonna turn down my heat to about a medium high at this point. So now we've reached our 230 degrees Fahrenheit. We're gonna add our chopped toasted pecans. And the reason we use pecans here is pecans are native to the Mississippi Delta. 
So they are uh, indigenous to our region, that's why they're here. And also, well, if you've ever traveled outside of New Orleans, you realize there's a lot of sugar cane grown here. So kind of it really makes sense why this is a very popular candy here in New Orleans. I'm also gonna add my salt at this point. I'm monitoring my temperature closely. And the temperature now that I've added my nuts we're looking for is gonna be 237 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so now that I've, I've reached our temperature of 237 degrees Fahrenheit, we're gonna remove it from our burner and we're allow this to cool down now to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So we've cooled it down now to about 212 degrees. It's a little bit lower. So at this point, we want to agitate our product. So we're just gonna cause the sugar to crystallize. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just gonna beat this. You want a good stiff spoon for this, a wooden spoon will work. So now we're gonna stir this. You can see it's starting to thicken, but so at this point, it's fairly thick, um, but it's at a point where I'm, not, I'm going to want to start to scoop it. I'm going to take my proline mixture and I'm going to start scooping it onto my prepared tray. You can make these any size that you want. This will get you, uh, with this size scoop, about a dozen and a half. So now that our prolines have cooled, they've completely crystallized, we're ready to eat them. And that's how you make a New Orleans style proline. All you need to do now is eat it. I need to clear something up about New Orleans. While our culinary scene might be on fire, our food has never been about heat. It's always been about flavor. And this is how New Orleans does flavor. Are we clear? Crystal, how New Orleans does flavor. Did you know that the Port of South Louisiana handles approximately 60 billion in trade annually? This is Paul Oak, my executive director of the Port of South Louisiana, and I'm here to tell you that currently the Port of South Louisiana pumps $14.4 billion in revenue and $72.5 million in taxes to the regional economy. Port activities support over 30,000 direct jobs. That's six out of 10 jobs in the river region, contributing $1.8 billion to local household earnings. The Port of South Louisiana, the most important port you've probably never heard of. In Baton Rouge, Mardi Gras means one thing, the raucous parade known as Spanish Town. Now in its 41st year, this annual parade winds through downtown Baton Rouge before ending at the state capitol. But don't wear the traditional purple, green, and gold. Spanish Town is all about pink. The symbol of the parade is the pink flamingo. It tells Baton Rougeans that being quirky and totally yourself is better than being normal. Or, in the words of Spanish Town residents, poor taste is better than no taste at all. Mardi Gras in the, in the 50s was a very special day for the gay community because it was the one day of the year when you could actually legally dress in drag. Doug Jones always had a group of his friends over at his home to watch the crew of Carrollton Parade. And this group of men eventually formally organized the first gay carnival crew, and they called it Yuga. And it became enormously popular. From the ashes of Yuga, there arose many other uh, gay carnival crews, uh, Petronius, Arminius, Amun-Ra, several others. In their heyday in the late 70s, early 80s, there were probably 15 to 20 gay crews. Gay activity in New Orleans at the time was French bar. So the police would be in the bars. You couldn't touch anybody. If you couldn't dance with anybody, you went to jail if you did anything like that. So it was very, very restrictive. The only day of the year you were allowed to wear a costume or drag was Mardi Gras day. And you had to have one piece of men's clothing on, no matter how you dressed, or the police could arrest you. Balls became very popular. Everybody wanted to go. It was originally only for gay men and women. Each member was allowed to say whether or not a person could attend. You had to look at the guest list. Turns out it was your mom on somebody else's guest list. You could say they can't come. But after a while, all that fell by the wayside and lots and lots of straight people came to the balls as well because it was so much fun. Eventually, gay Mardi Gras became the hot ticket in town. The mayor wanted tickets to go. I mean, it, it was wild. It was the biggest parties ever, but all in seclusion and quiet, you know? And it, it, it was amazing that we're in this time now that we can look back and say, wow, these people were brave. They went to jail, you know? They went to jail for what they, they believed, for being themselves. 
and not for hurting anyone, for just having a good time and enjoying Mardi Gras. Because if anything Mardi Gras shows you, that is the best time in life to have a good time. A lot of Mardi Gras crews are based on Greek mythology with their names. The crew of Armenius was the jilted admirer of Narcissus, really one of the first gay characters you read about in history. Crew name is the crew of Amun-Ra, the Egyptian sun god. With the Egyptian theme, we've carried that on to our logos, our programs, anything. Usually we have the pyramids and Cleopatra, all of that. So we've we followed the Egyptian theme since. The founders of the crew decided to go with a medieval theme, hence where the name Lords comes from. Obviously the leather because of their affiliation with the leather communities. When we walk in a parade, we wear leather. We stand out from the crowd. We want the glitz, we want the glam, the crowns and the pageantry, but we want to be fun. We want to poke fun at it and have fun and just laugh and have a good time. We actually are the only crew that's had a ball every year. We've had our 55th ball uh, this year. Crew of Armenians is all about the queen, honey. Pretty much the whole ball culminates with the curtain opening up for the queen at the end of the night. To experience that culmination of 50 years of history of a gay crew making it through to this time. Mardi Gras to me is the ultimate New Orleans experience. When people around the country think of Mardi Gras and New Orleans, they automatically connect them. They think of costumes, they think of parades, parties, balls, of which our crew is a big part of that. It's just really what New Orleans is built on. Gay Mardi Gras is thoroughly ingrained in New Orleans culture. I don't think Mardi Gras could happen without gay Mardi Gras happening. Not to really even separate the two of them, it's just Mardi Gras. We happen to be a gay crew who provides a place for anyone to come and enjoy the celebration. I'm a folk artist, I'm a historian, I'm a counselor, I'm a gardener, so many things. Ashton Ramsey is a Mardi Gras legend, and he's been parading and decorating his collage suits since the 1980s. Nowadays, though, he wants folks to remember him more for his work with the children than his colorful suits. I was a custodian at Coyne Senior High School, but I was also the carpenter there. See, this one of my exhibit at the uh, Ogden Museum. It's me and my children. You see, I was showing them how to make hats. Mr. Ramsey calls it cultural awareness art, and his suits have gone on to be seen around the world. This is a brochure when I exhibit at the Louvre, right here, in Paris, France. There's my name right there. And this one is money. In the beginning, in the 60s and 70s, we would have two parades a year, two second lines a year, Jolly Bunch and Young Men Olympic. And I used to uh, parade with the Dirty Dozen Kazoo Brass Band. The Dirty Dozen Kazoo Band was a family thing. It was the Baptiste family. The, the Kazoo Band was, was dying out, and I didn't want to parade. I couldn't parade with nobody else. I had the money. It wasn't hard to decorate suits. I was already... Uh, uh, parading, but I wasn't making individual costumes. Now this was the first phone, first cell phone. Now this is a picture from 1990. It was taken on the, by the Caledonia. It was a group of us, and we became the crew of Treme till today. 
I'm the crew of Treme. Everybody else, history. This is about all the places no longer in existence. This happened right after Katrina, this costume here, 2006, okay? And then, then this here is this year's, last year's costume says, I see you. Uh, samples, this is claw samples. Oh, shit, look, look how big I am. <laughs> but even after all of his accomplishments, he takes the greatest pride in his work with the children of New Orleans. I volunteered at Craig School, at Arise, at Green School, at Haley. Bond is here. All this, this is, I used to use this to treat, teach with. All these books was for the kids. And then I asked him question, what is the most, your most precious resource? Time. When you got time, you can study the universe. You can make money. You can spend time with your family. Time, time, okay? My name is Kirk Frady, and I'm the proprietor of Frady's One Stop Food Store in New Orleans, Bywater area. My father opened the store in 1972. We've been selling sandwiches and plate lunches since then. Little mom and pop store. We have a lot of traditional old school poor boys who put a lot of love and care in our sandwiches. That's what you're gonna get when you come here. We slice the bread, we slather it with mayonnaise, add the lettuce, tomatoes, and pickles. We slice and fry some potatoes, add some seasoning to it, and add it to the sandwich. We add a little roast beef gravy to it, hot sauce, and that's what we call a French fry poor boy. We are so lucky that we love food in New Orleans, and we have a lot of food here. And we're just all foodies, I think. We're attracted to, to the music scene and the food scene, too. No matter how you say it, as long as it's good, nobody's gonna argue with you. Poor boy or poor boy, it's gotta be good. So the band was like started in 1962, 63. Everybody wrong. 20, My father played the washboard in the, the Zydeco Cajun band. He had just as much soul as Ray Charles. I have a lot of brothers and sisters. Um, I'm actually number 14. It's like a, a sitcom or something like that, and I am actually the last kid, or so I think. My mother and father are the ones who helped to start this program. We won the Apollo Talent Show in 1965. This David Baptiste and Gladiator. And because my father, uh, you know, he was our version of Mick Jagger, in a sense. You know, one of the greatest unsung heroes as, as a performer. And actually, uh, Steven Tyler uh, saw me in the Ritz Carlton penthouse and kissed my hand and he said, man, you are music royalty. And I didn't know who that was <laughs> at first. It was Steven Tyler. To play with my father means a lot because it started from him. He's the one who uh, consistently put me every in every position that I was in musically. Uh, you know, he put me in front of the meters. People know Russell Baptiste because of my dad, David. Uh, he's just the one who put me out there in front of all of those cats. The Baptiste fathers and sons are carrying on the family legacy. Wendell Pierce uh, gave my dad the best compliment. He said he is basically the cornerstone of New Orleans. And he said, you guys are not just doing music, you're doing uh, civic work, you're bringing people together. So that's who we are, that's what we do, uh, attracting cultural tourism. That is the Baptiste fathers and sons, the Baptiste family, the Baptiste legacy. We are a festival band. But the Mardi Gras music, man, it was so soulful, you know. It's something that uh, I love playing. I love hearing it. You know, I'm inspired by it, you know, and to hear my sons play it. You know, they have, all of them have their own different version, but the soul is still there. The whole focus and point of when speaking to the people through music is giving them the therapy that they need to where they can, you know, actually be happy because everybody's going through something. So to be able to be a part of the therapeutic part of the music that brings joy and happiness to people, uh, courage, strength, perseverance, you know, life soundtrack, that's a beautiful thing.
Louisiana produces nearly one-third of all the seafood consumed in America, but the pearl of Louisiana's harvest is the oyster. There are dozens and dozens of ways to prepare this southern delicacy, but none have caught fire like the char-grilled oyster created right here at Drago's restaurant almost 30 years ago. The key ingredient to a charbroiled oyster is a beautiful Louisiana oyster. There are none better. The constant mixing of the fresh water and the salt water, that marriage creates a big, beautiful, salty Louisiana oyster, second to none. You take butter, garlic, parsley, and cheese, and that's the single best bite of food in town. This is New Orleans' neighbor, just five minutes from the Crescent City. It's also home to the Louisiana Oyster Trail, a collection of restaurants throughout this coastal parish that have mastered the art of preparing oysters as a main dish. We go through well over three million oysters a year just in our two restaurants in New Orleans. We do them a dozen at a time, and we do it with a whole lot of French bread. My favorite oyster dish would be the charbroiled oysters. I love the garlic butter sauce and the cheese. It's one of our most popular things. Fold crawfish, crabs and shrimp, and charbroiled oysters rank among the top sellers. I'm Sam Perino, been in seafood business for 50 years, owner of Perino's Seafood and owner of Perino's Ball and Putt for 21 years. Raw ice is better than anything else to eat, but I also eat the fried and the char grilled oysters. We joined the Oyster Trail because it was a great opportunity to promote oysters and our business. We're among the elite of Jefferson Parish and we're honored to be part of that program. For Mardi Gras this year, we'll be open for business and I think we're gonna be pretty busy. So this Mardi Gras being a very different Mardi Gras, we decided to bring Mardi Gras to our restaurant. So we put up our own little float for people to take pictures in front of. It's really hard for Ricabona's Pepper Mill because the parade's turned right in front of our restaurant all these years. But we're gonna celebrate with special Mardi Gras cocktails and our little decorations that we did to honor our tradition here what we have in New Orleans. In addition to our many oyster dishes, we also serve them in our famous Riccobono's Bloody Mary. That's a homemade Bloody Mary blend that we make and we top it with three fried oysters. So, you know, you can eat them, drink them, you can have them however you like. We're out of time, but if you're ready to start eating your way through the Louisiana Oyster Trail, just go to visitjeffersonparish.com and you're gonna find dozens of restaurants where you see these Louisiana oyster sculptures outside, which means delicious oysters inside. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you in part by Swan's Down Cake Flower. So light it floats. Music brings us together without us having to be together. And it's no secret that musicians make up the cultural fabric of New Orleans. After all, it's the birthplace of jazz. Now for many years, this place has been considered a home for thousands of thriving musicians. And while this past year has affected the music community more than ever, we've seen an outpouring of support from our city. New Orleanians have been lucky enough to enjoy porch sessions and concerts in the park. So we wanted to give thanks to those wonderful melody makers who have helped us get through it all through their music. Please stay tuned to find out how you can help our fabulous musicians. The Preservation Hall Foundation engages and supports musicians provides much needed support and services to the elder members of the musical community. We also conserve and share jazz music archives and spaces, provide educational experiences for students, families, the general public. There's also grant making to provide recognition and merit and also alleviate need. But a central part of the Preservation Hall Foundation's mission is to support and value the elder members of the community. Through our legacy program, when a member of the musical community reaches age 65, we give them the title Master Practitioner. And then they receive special recognition and special services. And you know, that effort still continues despite the pandemic. So we're doing all that we can to make sure that we sustain their health, 
that we're there for them, even if it's just a phone call, and also make sure that we can enable their continued contributions to New Orleans music and culture. We dearly miss welcoming kids and students into the hall, but there's been a special project three plus years in the making that we're ready to launch, free educational online content called Preservation Hall Lessons. Videos and other content for teachers nationwide, K through 12, again, free. And you can find that at www.preshallfoundation.org. And now, We'd like to pay our respects to a legendary artist and entrepreneur, the man who made Mardi Gras the dazzling spectacle that it is today, Mr. Blaine Kern Sr., known to many as Mr. Mardi Gras. Blaine founded Kern Studios right here at Mardi Gras World in 1947. He and his team of extraordinary artists brought imagination to life by designing and building floats for some of the biggest and most well-known parades and making Carnival an unforgettable experience for all. As the man once said himself, he brought happiness to millions of people every year, and for that, we thank him. Blaine Kern Sr. passed away on June 26, 2020, at the age of 93. Thank you, Mr. Mardi Gras. Blaine Kern, my father, was a really interesting guy. Um, had an incredible imagination, had a lot of energy, and lots and lots of ideas. Blaine was larger than life. He was the kind of guy he's talking to, he's so full of enthusiasm and excitement. He was an artist, but also he was a, a promoter. He loved New Orleans, came up very humbly. And he started as a little boy with his, with his dad, who built some floats in the back of a garbage wagon uh, for the crew of Allah back in 1932. But Mardi Gras was a small, very small, small industry. My dad's impact on Mardi Gras, Blaine's impact on Mardi Gras, when he started in the business, there was several thousand members of these carnival organizations. It wasn't even really an industry. It was minuscule. It was a local celebration. Darwin Fenner, then captain of Rex, sent Blaine as a young man over to Europe entirely paid for by Mr. Fenner. And Blaine came back with these marvelous, enormous and animated papier-mâché figures from Via Reggio, Italy. Nobody here had seen anything like that. And they were spectacular and sensational. And Blaine became an overnight star of New Orleans. What Blaine takes credit for, and I think he deserves a lot of credit for, is opening up Mardi Gras to everyone. Men, women, all races, ethnicity, and, and making it possible for everyone to really participate in Mardi Gras. He had an idea that more people should be able to participate in Mardi Gras, not just people who had a lot of money, who could build their own floats. So he decided to create a pool of rental floats with various themes. So other people could say, you know, we'll, we'll start an organization. We don't have to own the floats, we'll rent them. And that opened up and really democratized Carnival quite a bit. Now, you know, he would be the first to tell you that he did that for, for business reasons, but, but the effect was that it diversified Mardi Gras. And I think that's one of his, his greatest contributions. The idea of super crews, of having guest celebrities, of big, building bigger and bigger floats, that was, that was all Blaine Kern and Mardi Gras is richer because of his innovations. I think he earned the title because he, he, he did so much to make Mardi Gras what it is today. What we know of as Mardi Gras today is thanks in large part to Blaine Kern. To this day, when I drive down the street and people see the Kern, they immediately say Blaine. Everybody knew Blaine and they loved what he had done. He always said, anywhere else in the world, I'd just be a float builder, but to be the guy who builds Mardi Gras in New Orleans, set you up, you know, is it puts him on a pedestal and it put us and it puts us on a pedestal to be the guys that produce the the the, the, the biggest praise in Carnival. Blaine called himself Mr. Mardi Gras, but he earned the title. He's really one of the most influential people uh, in the last century and, and this one too I suppose. Uh, he's just a, a very much an innovator and a, a wonderful entrepreneur, saw opportunities everywhere. Blaine spent his whole life trying to build it and to make it better. And um, you know, it was, it was easy to do when you have a, such a unique and wonderful city and, and wonderful people. 
Debutante balls are a long-standing tradition in the months leading up to Carnival. Going back 150 years, this custom involves private clubs throwing lavish parties where they honor young women by presenting them to hundreds of admiring guests. They even get their own special showcase in the newspaper. Style, grace, and poise epitomize the New Orleans debutante. And our next guest joining us is none other than my friend Nell Nolan to tell us a little more about the debutante season. Originally, the debutantes would uh, be presented to young men of their age group, and uh, they would be looking for a spouse. And that was sort of the rite of passage that they were doing. It's something that families in certain groups have done for generations. It's the carrying forward of a custom <clears throat> that began in 1857 with when the Mystic Crew of Comus made its debut. The families who are in these organizations attach tremendous significance to them. I mean, you can go in homes in certain quarters and you'll see in display cases a crown that Great Aunt Sophia wore, wore or a scepter. It's part of the warp and woof of Carnival. I think we look back at the tradition of it and the debutantes were uh, being introduced. This is always, a, it was a presentation. Uh, what we're seeing now is that the young women are focused on what comes after the debutante year as far as career. It's an honor to be uh, considered a debutante. It means that your family has some standing in the community that your father, your grandfather has worked in a particular organization so that you can have the privilege, the excitement, the fun of being presented as a debutante. For the culture of the city, the balls represent many things. It's the continuation of tradition. They also represent a fair contribution to the city's economy. If you look at what goes into a ball, because you're getting flowers, you're talking musicians, you're talking rental of a room, you're talking women who make the gowns for the Debs who are bowing. The necklace that I'm wearing is made up of the crew favors from 20, 20, in other words, just last year. Since we will not have a formal carnival this year, there will not be any crew favors for 2021. So these are special until 2022. The experience of making a debut, the experience of being a queen is whirlwind activity. And there are young women who are asking me, they're on the brink of making a debut, and they say, what would you suggest? Number one, do your Christmas shopping in the summer. Number two, always have comfortable shoes for presentations. Number three, have a clothes rack, a separate clothes rack for your ball gowns because they won't fit into your closet. And number four, listen to your mother. Debs originally existed to let people know that this woman was on the marriage market. That's not so much the same anymore. Nevertheless, people keep doing it. Dear 2020, you had your time. I want to break free. Now it's our time. Time to get away to a place where we can finally be free. Free from boundaries, limitations, even virtual backgrounds. Today, we break free. I want to break free. Ready to break free? Plan your future getaway with Norwegian Cruise Line. Sail safe, feel free. Want to ride in a carnival parade in 2022? Visit www.nola.com forward slash win carnival 2022 for more information and to enter. Here they come. Here they Today, what does it mean for me to come together with other Mardi Gras Indians? Considering the time that we are in right now with COVID and being on restrictions, um, and we understand that we won't be able to mass this year. So it's, it's, it's refreshing to be able to put on your suit and have that camaraderie with you know other members of the nation. Mardi Gras Indians first started out at least about 200 years ago. It started out as a way for black men to express themselves during the Mardi Gras culture, the Mardi Gras time. They wasn't allowed to be part of the traditional Mardi Gras, so black men, men of color, would dress up 
and parade through the neighborhoods to give their neighborhoods and their people a part of Mardi Gras that they wasn't able to get. The reason we mask as Mardi Gras Indians is to pay homage to the Native Americans for helping some of our people during slavery. My tribe is very unique. We have a chief who is one of the longest tenure masking Indians in the culture, Chief Monk Boudreaux of the Golden Eagles. He's been masking consistently for about 53 or 54 years. I'm the big chief of the Ninth War Black Hatchet. Uh, my tribe was established 2017. My first year masking was 1999 up under the Ninth Ward Hunters. When I was younger, I was masked with the All Youth Tribe. This started in 2014. It was my first year masking. Four years later, I decided it was time for me to part ways with the tribe. So 2018 was the first year that I brought my own tribe. The history of the Golden Eagles, it started with my dad, uh, Big Chief Monk Boudreaux. It started in 1968. Uh, he was a member of the White Eagles Indian tribe, and he was voted by some of his peers to become a chief. For people who don't understand the positions of Mardi Gras Indian tribe, there are different positions. It's set up sort of like military, for instance. You have positions that scout out, that looks for any kind of oncoming trouble. That would be the spy boy. As a spy boy, I'm gonna stand in the front, I'm gonna hold you up and whoever behind you until my chief catch up and your chief catch up. So it give me more time to trash talk, display my suit, dance, and really showboat my regalia. You also have flag boys in the tribe, and the flag boy's job is to pass signals from the front of the tribe to the back of the tribe and back to the front. The wild man is the protector of the chief. He's pretty much running back and forth throughout the game to make sure that everything is fine. And of course, we have the big chiefs, we run the tribe, we're in the back having all the fun, and we get all the glory. Coming together with um, Mardi Gras Indians is generally, um, I would say, almost like a war game in the beginning. It's a long list of great chiefs who came and decided to make the needle the competition and not fists, guns, and uh, weapons. And the competition is who gonna sit down the longest? Because I can make a suit this right here in the week. Okay, and this another week, that's two weeks. But to put this whole thing together, I'm gonna need 52. Are uh, you gonna be able to sit down for 52 weeks and show your determination, show your competitiveness, how focused you are in order to come out on the street, on Mardi Gras, and be able to compete with others. Hi, I'm John Bell Edwards, and it's my privilege to serve as governor of the great state of Louisiana. I wanna thank you for watching our show tonight. I also want to thank all the artists, musicians, chefs, filmmakers, and others who put their hard work into tonight. Mardi Gras is such a special time in our state. In my family, we eat as much king cake as we possibly can, and we revel in the people and the traditions that make our great state unique. Tonight's show was just the first of three. We'll be back tomorrow night and Sunday night at 8 Central with all new shows, featuring even more of what makes Louisiana unique and special. So thanks for watching tonight. We hope you can come back tomorrow, and even more, we hope you can come visit us just as soon as it's safe to do so. Until then, Lazy Le Bon Temps Roulet. Tonight's show is made possible through the generous support of our sponsors. Coming back to New Orleans You know it really is that land of dreams There's no other city like New Orleans I knew that I just couldn't stay away So I came back and now I'm home to stay And rebuild my life in New Orleans Stormy weather may come and go
Mother Nature may put on her show Still in my mind there's nowhere else to go So baby won't you please come home To New Orleans where they still say hello To the music, and the culture, all the people that you know There's just nothing more than New Orleans 